Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, the show where we cover all the best news and events relating to space and spaceflight for the past seven days and for the upcoming seven days. I know that you know that I know that the story we're all the most excited about this week is the success of SpaceX's Starship SN10, so we'll get to that straight away without too much intro dilly-dally, though I will quickly ask you to make sure you're subscribed so that you're notified of these videos when they're live so that the news is correct and is delivered in its most up to date state anyway let's transition to our first segment all the launches and events from last week so yes the biggest news of last week was undoubtedly the high altitude flight test of the starship serial number 10 this test wasn't really any different in design to the test flights of the SN8 and SN9, though with the obvious goal of trying to stick the landing this time. The flight proceeded nominally, and then as it approached the landing zone, the vehicle successfully performed its flip manoeuvre, and this time ignited all three of its engines, rather than following the flight plan of SN8 and 9, which only fired two. After successful ignition, all but one of the Raptors were shut off, and descent was performed with a single engine and we already know that a single Raptor landing is possible for this vehicle thanks to the test hops of SN5 and SN6. And much like the SN5 and 6, the SN10 levelled out successfully, steered its way towards the landing zone and actually managed to touch down in one piece. This was absolutely huge and this will 100% go down as a massive moment in history. However, looking carefully at this slow motion footage from Tim Dodd, aka the Everyday Astronaut, it's clear that the landing wasn't perfect. Firstly, you can see that the landing legs here didn't seem to deploy properly. Some of them are swinging loose underneath the rocket and not locked in place. And then you can see that upon initial touchdown, the rocket bounced on the pad, implying that it hit the ground too fast. As the smoke cleared, the SN10 had a very clear lean to it, but nonetheless remained apparently intact. The issues with the legs isn't necessarily a big deal, since these are only temporary test stand legs and not intended to be used in the final Starship design. But their failure may have had a hand in the events that followed. I'm not going to try and pretend like you don't already know what happened. The SN10 exploded just under 10 minutes after touchdown. SpaceX haven't released any official statement or explanation as to why the SN10 decided that it didn't want to live on this planet anymore, and it's likely that they're still conducting their own internal investigation. However, I would urge everyone to watch Scott Manley's breakdown of the events preceding and proceeding the Starship's final moments for a great in-depth exploration of the rapid unplanned reflight and then disassembly. <laughs> Elon Musk stated on Twitter that the engine thrust was too low on the landing, despite being commanded to be higher, which led to the hard touchdown. So far, the cause of this mechanical mutiny has baffled SpaceX, but I'm sure they'll figure it out, hopefully in time for the flight of the Starship SN11, which will hopefully land a little more controlled and a little more upright, such that it can be reflown, or rather, intentionally reflown, a second time. We are, overall, still hot off the heels of the SN10 landing, so I expect more news and developments will emerge over the next few days, so this is all very exciting stuff to watch. I have no doubt at all that SpaceX will iron out all of the kinks, if not for the SN11, then definitely for the next in-line prototype, the SN15. Why am I so confident? Well, the Starship has teams of very smart people behind it, all of whom have a keen understanding of rocket science and engineering. And if you would like to try and learn about these topics too, then why not consider Brilliant, who have once again kindly sponsored Space This Week. Brilliant is a fantastic problem-solving online resource that has over 60 interactive learning courses in science, maths, and computer science. What I love about Brilliant is they have a real knack in taking complex and intimidating topics and breaking them down into easily understood chunks. I'm guessing that if you're watching this video then you probably find rocket launches interesting. Maybe you'd like to learn more about the physics behind these amazing vehicles, in which case Brilliant has an excellent course in classical mechanics, which provides a great hands-on learning experience on a wide range of topics that rocket scientists work with every day, including angular kinematics, the rocket equation, and of course Einstein's theory of relativity. And every step of the way, the content is presented in a fun and engaging way. If this all sounds good to you, then click on my link, also on screen, brilliant.org slash 
as using my link will not only let Brilliant know that you came from here, but will also get the first 200 people to use it 20% off their annual premium subscription. Brilliant elevates maths and science from something to be feared to a delightful experience of guided discovery, so don't forget to click that link. With sponsorships aside, I cannot wait to talk about the news from Starship over the coming weeks for the foreseeable future. Developments are happening at such a rapid rate that it's hard to stay on top of all the constant developments that are happening down at SpaceX's Texan rocket farm. Of course, Starship isn't the only rocket that SpaceX own. They also have the Falcon 9, which made a flight of its own last week as well. It was the only orbital launch of last week too, and was another Starlink mission that launched on March the 4th from the Kennedy Space Center. This was Starlink L-17, which actually suffered from so many delays that it eventually launched after L-18 and L-19, but it's nice to see that despite the delays with this launch, everything went to plan, with the first stage successfully landing 633 kilometers downrange on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, and the 60 Starlink satellites successfully deploying into low Earth orbit. Recovery of the fairing halves from the water was successfully conducted by the ships Go Navigator and Go Searcher as well, so all in all, another successful Starlink mission for SpaceX. Starlink was the only orbital launch last week, but we did see a suborbital launch as well. This was a three-stage Terrier Oriole sounding rocket that was launched by the US Space Force from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. A sounding rocket is much smaller than the rockets we'd normally talk about on space this week, as they're only designed to go straight up and straight down, only briefly passing the edge of space. They're almost always designed for research purposes, and this flight was no different. The flight was to study ionization in space just beyond the reaches of Earth's atmosphere, an ideal job for a sounding rocket. After flying to altitude, the rocket's payload released a small quantity of vapor into the near vacuum of space, though don't worry, there is no danger to the environment or to public health from this release. Starship and launch news aside, there's one final piece of news that I want to discuss from last week, and that's Rocket Lab's very exciting announcement. Rocket Lab, frequently featured on Space This Week with their Electron rocket, have decided that they want to tackle the medium lift launch vehicle market. To do this, they're going to build a bigger rocket, the Neutron. Little has really been shown of this vehicle other than one render, and a mock-up of a fairing half of the vehicle with a Peter Beck, Rocket Lab CEO, for scale. The Neutron is most comparable to SpaceX's Falcon 9, it's a two-stage vehicle with a recoverable first stage, and it's primarily focused on the growing Mega Constellation satellite delivery market. While stumpier than the Falcon 9 and capable of delivering only about half the payload mass to low Earth orbit, the Neutron will nonetheless be able to fulfill a huge role in the medium lift launch vehicle market. It will have a low Earth orbit payload mass of 8 metric tons, making it very capable of lifting almost all payloads without problem, and it'll even be able to support human crewed missions as well. It's no secret that the Falcon 9 has entered Electron's market with SpaceX's new rideshare missions, and with more and more small sat vehicles emerging, such as Astra's rocket, uh, rocket, it's no surprise that Rocket Lab want to stay ahead of the curve and expand into the medium lift market. Right now, very little is really known about what the Neutron will be, if it will use the electric pump feed cycle like the Electron, or if Rocket Lab will go for a more conventional turbo pump design. The rocket body itself looks very different from the all-black carbon composite Electron. The grey here may represent a stainless steel or aluminium material, or could just as equally be a placeholder texture while Rocket Lab continue to go through design possibilities. Really, we don't know much about this rocket at all beyond the name and its purported abilities, but it's definitely exciting to hear about, and I can't wait to see its first launch, which Rocket Lab hope will be in 2024. The Neutron reveal is the final bit of news from last week that I wanted to talk about, which means that we can now transition nicely to our next segment, or the launches planned for the next seven days. Are you enjoying this video so far though? If so, please leave a like down below, as it helps me to feed my starving family. <laughs> anyway. The first launch of the week will be on March the 10th and will be another Starlink mission. I've talked about Starlink already in this episode and this launch will be functionally no different. The booster will launch from Cape Canaveral with the first stage planned to land 633 kilometers downrange on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship and ships Go Searcher and Go Navigator will attempt to scoop the fairing halves from the water. 
the satellites will deploy soon after second stage separation, and this will be the sixth flight of this particular Falcon 9 first stage. He is hoping this flight goes as smoothly as its previous ones. The next launch will be on the 12th of March and will be a Long March 7A, which will launch from the Wenchang Launch Complex in China. The payload is a Chinese Xin Jishu Yanzhen 6 technology demonstration satellite, which will be placed into geosynchronous Earth orbit. Also on the 12th of March, India will launch a suborbital Rohini RH-300 Mark III sounding rocket from the Satish Dhawan Space Center. I can't show you what this would look like, unfortunately, since India copyright claim footage of their launches, so enjoy this cat video instead. <laughs> Not much is really known about the rocket's payload, but the chief purpose of the Rohini rocket family is meteorological and atmospheric study, so one can assume that it'll be for this. On the 13th of March, we'll see another Starlink launch. Let's come this one even quicker. It'll look pretty much the same as the previous launch. On the 14th of March, we'll see another Chinese launch, this time a Long March 4C launching from the Huiquan Satellite Launch Center. On board will be a GFN-12 Earth Observation Satellite destined for low Earth orbit. It'll also be the final launch of the week, which means an end to this segment of the show. Let us move along then to our final segment. All of the best and most exciting spaceflight anniversaries set to take place over the next seven days. Our first historic anniversary will be tomorrow on March the 9th. On this day in 2011, Space Shuttle Discovery made its final landing after clocking in 39 flights. This was the end of mission STS-133, during which the Discovery docked with the International Space Station, transferring several items to the station including the permanent multipurpose module Leonardo, which is a module primarily used for the storage of spares, supplies and waste, and also serves as the personal hygiene area for the astronauts who live on the US orbital segment of the station. The Discovery also carried the third of four express logistics carriers, which attach to the outside of the station and serve as unpressurized payload platforms for various different items such as scientific experiments and command and data handling services. The total flight time for Discovery's final mission was 12 days, 19 hours, 4 minutes and 50 seconds, pushing the vehicle's cumulative total space flight time to a full year in space, and the mission brought an end to a historic chapter in our pursuit of the great beyond. On the 10th of March in 2006, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter arrived at Mars. This was launched in August of the previous year and remains operational to this day. It's designed to search for evidence of water on Mars, and while other missions have shown that Mars did indeed used to have flowing water, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is on a search for evidence that water persisted on Mars long enough to provide a habitat for life. The probe can do this by using extreme close-up photography of the Martian surface, by analysing materials, looking for subsurface water, trace how much dust and water are distributed in the atmosphere, and by monitoring daily global weather. The satellite is still operating at Mars, far beyond its intended lifespan, and due to its now vital role as a high-speed data relay for ground missions, NASA intend to continue the mission as long as possible, at least through the late 2020s. Thank you for your 25 years of service so far, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. On the 11th of March 1960, a Thor Able rocket launched NASA's Pioneer 5 spacecraft. We talked a lot about Pioneer 10 in last week's episode, so it's nice we can visit one of its predecessors this week. The spacecraft was a sphere with a diameter of 66 centimeters, with four solar panels on arms and four scientific instruments on board. Its primary purpose was to investigate interplanetary space between the orbits of Earth and Venus. It transmitted data for nearly two months, and during its various scientific measurements it confirmed the existence of interplanetary magnetic fields. Now, Pioneer 5 was originally supposed to conduct a Venus flyby, however the launch was delayed due to technical issues from the originally planned date of November 1959, by which point the Venus transfer window had closed. Still, with its new mission objective of investigating interplanetary space, the Pioneer 5 was a roaring success and helped pave the way for NASA's vibrant future of missions to the furthest reaches of the solar system and beyond. On the 13th of March in 1781, William Herschel discovered Uranus. Yes, it's got a funny name, that's out of our systems now. His namesake is the Greek god of the sky, who was the grandfather of Zeus and father of Cronus. Uranus, along with Neptune, 
is classified as an ice giant, as its chemical composition is slightly different to the larger gas giants Jupiter and Saturn. Like Jupiter and Saturn, its atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, but it also contains more so-called ices, such as water, ammonia, methane, and trace amounts of other hydrocarbons. Uranus has the coldest planetary atmosphere in the whole solar system, with temperatures as low as 49 Kelvin or minus 224 degrees Celsius. I think the thing I find the most interesting about Uranus, though, is the fact that its axis of rotation is rotated sideways, such that it rotates almost vertically to the plane of its solar orbit. Its north and south poles therefore lie where most other planets have their equators. Its 27 known moons rotate in an apparent polar orbit as well, because of this sideways axis. It's not entirely clear why it rotates like this. It might be due to a collision with a planet-sized body, or several small bodies, soon after it was formed. As of today, and likely for several years more unfortunately, Voyager 2 remains the only spacecraft to have visited the planet, and it took this photograph in 1986. Interestingly, Uranus' discovery isn't the only anniversary the planet has this week. Earlier in the week, we had the anniversary for the discovery of its rings, which were definitively discovered on the 10th of March in 1977, though it's worth noting that William Herschel mentioned the possibility of rings in February 1789, where he documented that a ring was suspected. Anyway, those are what I think are the most interesting historic anniversaries set to take place this week, so let us now move on to our closing thoughts segment. <laughs> My goodness, what a wild week it's been. It's hard to try and summarize all the events that took place when they're all so overshadowed by the roaring success of the Starship SN10. Shame about the hiccup at the end, but this was nonetheless a gigantic milestone in the Starship program, and with this seemingly exponential acceleration in the gaps between the flight tests, I don't think we'll have to wait very long at all for SN11 to hopefully perform even better than its predecessor. Of course, only time will tell. After all, the SN9 didn't seem to do quite as well as the SN8. Before we wrap up fully, I have to say a big thank you once again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's episode of Space This Week. Check them out using my custom URL to tell the folks over there that you came from Space This Week. And remember that the first 200 of you to do so will get 20% off your annual premium subscription. I'm going to leave a couple of things on screen. The left is the full Space This Week playlist. The right is another video of mine selected for you by YouTube's algorithms. Hopefully it's a good pick. If you want to support the channel further, then make sure you like and subscribe. And if you want to go even further, there's links to my Patreon and merch stores down below. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you on Saturday for our next Kerbal Adventure. <laughs>